Let's all stand, stretch out a little bit this morning. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of stretch out. There's something, you know, there's something we do down south. Maybe I can share with you guys this morning. If you'll take your hand, put it right back between your shoulder blades like this, and come straight out like this, and back like this, <laughs> back like this. Wow. I didn't know there was so many Atlanta Braves fans here. You can be seated. Can't believe you fell for that. <laughs> Wait till I get back home. You should have seen all those Cub fans, man. They were just doing the tomahawk chop. <laughs> Let's turn in our Bibles with Nehemiah. When Nehemiah received a burden from God, it was a great honor, but it was also a tremendous responsibility. And he fulfilled that responsibility by doing two things, by building and by battling. And those are the two ways that will fulfill the calling of God on our lives. This morning we want to talk about building, Nehemiah's building in the first session and his battling in the second session. Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put on my heart to do. Nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the shepherd well, serpent well, and the refuse gate, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, You see this distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. And Father, I ask that you inspire us today to do the same. Lord, you have put a burden upon our hearts You've placed us in a church, and there's work to be done, Lord. I pray that you'll help us to set our hands to do the good work you've given us. Strengthen our hearts and our lives, and the church is represented here today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Understand, men are builders by nature. They like to build stuff. Some men build businesses and careers, and companies. 
Others build houses. Other men build furniture. Lots of men build fast cars and powerful engines. Coaches build teams. Politicians build campaigns and alliances. Athletes like to body build. Most men build retirement funds and nest eggs. Women talk of starting a family, whereas men talk of building a life together. Women are by nature nesters and nurturers, while men are builders. Even at early ages, young males have this desire to build. My sons grew up wanting to be pro baseball players and builders. They took the wood scraps that I would bring home from the construction projects around our house and I'd throw it into the backyard and they would build stuff. They once built a tool shed that looked like some kind of jungle hut. It looked terrible, <laughs> but it was in the backyard and nobody could see it. When my kids were young, my little girl played with Barbies while my three sons played with Legos and Lincoln Logs and building blocks. In fact, if I had a quarter for every Lego I've stepped on in the middle of the night, I'd be a rich man. When we went to the beach, my boys built sandcastles. In the woods, they built tree huts. At a camp out, they built the fire. Big or small, young or old, men have an innate desire to build. This is one of the ways that we were made in the image of God. For God was the first builder. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word translated there, created, is the Hebrew word bara, which means to create out of nothing. God is the first cause. He's the prime mover. God begins with nothing but the power of his word, and he fashions the heavens and the earth. There is, though, another Hebrew term translated create, it's the word asa. And when you hear it, think of what it sounds like, a symbol. If we were to borrow this podium, we would just produce it out of thin air. But if we were to asa this podium, it means that we would go down to Home Depot. We would buy a few boards, some nails, some varnish, and then we would come back and we would put it all together. Now, Exodus 31 verse 17 is an interesting verse. It says, in six days, the Lord made or assad the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the heavens and earth were created out of nothing. God created the raw materials by nothing but the force of his word. But in Exodus 31, we're told that during the first six days, God took those existing building blocks and he fashioned them into the universe that we now know. But here's a thought. Since God was able to create the basic components out of nothing, why not just start with a finished product? Why did God fashion the world through specific acts over different days? Well, there are several answers to that question. But one is this. That just like my boys, God likes to take stuff and put other stuff with it and build stuff. For God is at heart a builder. And that's why God burdened the heart of Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. You know, the walls of the holy city were more than just simple fortifications. A city's walls were symbolic of its people's splendor and strength, and security, and status. On the tours that I take to Jerusalem, one of my favorite activities is to walk the ramparts, walk on top of the walls. At the Joppa Gate, you can climb up on top of the walls, and you can walk them all the way around to the edge of the Temple Mount. Today's walls are 4,000 years old, built by King Suleiman, on top of the foundations of Nehemiah's walls. But even today, Jerusalem's walls project an aura. They appear noble. They're just impressive and intriguing. And they stir up the visitor's emotion. You know, it's interesting that when God speaks of his love for Jerusalem, he mentions her walls. Isaiah 49 verses 15 and 16 reads, 
Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. It amazes me. When God thinks of his people Israel, he looks at those walls. Again, in Isaiah 60, verse 18, when God prophesies of Israel's future glory, his focus is on her walls. He says, violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. See, the walls were important to God, and he wanted them rebuilt. In a sense, Jerusalem's walls were to the Jews what the World Trade Center was to America. Those two twin towers were the epitome of American know-how. The splendid splinters showcased our ingenuity and our affluence. The twin towers were a symbol of our strength and our security and our status. And that's why they became targets. And that's also why a trip today to the 9-11 memorial at Ground Zero is so gut-wrenching. Not only is it a reminder of the terrorist attacks and its victims, but it's a reminder of what those Al-Qaeda fighters were determined to take from America. They wanted to shame us and topple our strength and shatter our security and shrink our status in the eyes of the world. Just a few weeks ago now, my wife and I, we visited the Statue of Liberty Park on the New Jersey side, and we saw the new trade center that's now been built to replace the old. It's now an important symbol of our nation's resilience. And this is how God and the Jews who cared about the things of God felt about Jerusalem's walls. These were once, these were once thick, ornate, strong walls. They were the ancient equivalent of the Twin Towers, a symbol of the nation Judah's strength, and they needed to be rebuilt. When the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, they didn't need to tear down its walls, but they did so to shame and shatter an already beaten nation, to humiliate their God as well. They toppled those stones in those timbers, and as a result, it became a Hebrew ground zero. Those walls were a scar on the nation's psyche, a symbol of their defeat. And God knew that his people would never fully recover until those walls were rebuilt. And I want you to understand this morning, this is how God feels about the walls of our lives. The spiritual walls I'm talking about. Of character and integrity and honesty and respect. And significance. See, the problem with sin in our lives is that it tears down those walls. Sin dirties my reputation and weakens my conscience and undercuts my strength and shatters my peace and shrinks my significance. It leaves our lives in ruin and in rubble. And sin wrecks marriages. For some of us, it has destroyed our marriage. It's ostracized our kids. It's ruined friendships. The man who just before he sins thinks the statement, ah, it's no big deal. I'm not hurting anybody. It's like the foolish ostrich who's buried his head in the sand. Notice when Jerusalem's comforter arrives on the scene, Nehemiah brings with him three commodities. He brings letters, he brings lumber, and he brings leadership. Notice verse 7 says that he brought letters from the king. If he was ever questioned, he could produce the proper permits. Verse 8, he brought lumber from the king's forest, beams and timbers, materials that would be needed to do the job. And then verse 13, Nehemiah provided leadership. He took a nighttime stroll around the city to inspect the damage, to see what he was up against and to formulate a plan. Nehemiah came to town with letters and with lumber and with leadership. And the Holy Spirit provides us all three things as well. 
His letters are his word, the truth of scripture. His lumber are his gifts, the fruits, the blessings that the Holy Spirit brings to our lives. And his leadership is his discernment, of course. The Spirit searches our hearts and he knows all wisdom and he sees our potential and he knows exactly where we need to be fixed. Remember his letters, his lumber, and his leadership. In fact, if you stumble over this point, you'll live long in the rubble. There is power in the letters. The assurance of our forgiveness, the proclamation of our freedom, all the promises that God has made to us, his permission to start over, the authority to be his children and to live under his banner is all found in the letters of the scripture. Without the black and red letters of your Bible, when the enemy questions you, you have no answers. You have no defense for the doubts and the fears and the worries. God's letters are our hope, the ground on which we walk. And the lumber. God's gifts are strong timber. They're beams on which we can lean. A life built with divine lumber will hold up against the stress of the storm. Only his love can satisfy our hearts. Only his fruits make life truly tasty. Only his power can make us the strong man our family needs. You need lumber from the king's forest. Don't try to build with other materials. And you're ready to get started when you walk in the spirit and let the Nehemiah of your heart begin to lead. God's spirit knows us better than we know ourselves. And he has surveyed the damage in your life. I hope you know the Holy Spirit has taken many a nighttime stroll around the rubble of your life. And he knows exactly what it'll take. He sees your potentials and he's eager to have a plan for reconstruction. See, when Nehemiah came to town, he brought with him letters and lumber and leadership. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he brings God's word and God's blessing and God's guidance. The Holy Spirit is at work to build God's kingdom in you. Nehemiah was ready, he was able, he was properly equipped, but there was one thing he lacked to execute his plans. He still needed the cooperation of the people. And so on the morning after his nighttime stroll, he called a meeting of the Jews. And again, in chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, Nehemiah tells us, Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in? How Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. And so they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Read again what the people of Jerusalem did. This is so strategic. This is our part. They set their hands to do this good work. There are actually five actions on the part of the people that I'd like to draw your attention to this morning. This is the part in the building of God that he wants you to participate in. This is how you cooperate with his plan. See, he comes to us with letters and lumber and leadership, but then we have a role to play. Chapter 2, verse 18 says, They set their hands to this good work. If you're taking notes, write this down. They set their hands. They set their hands. Second, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 32, they all took a portion of the wall to rebuild. Write this down. They found their place. First, they set their hands. Second, they found their place. Then in chapter 3, verse 5, you'll note that the Tekoites were told they did not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. But the implication is, is that the rest of the Jews did. Write this down. It's point three. They shouldered their share. 
They set their hands. They found their place. They shouldered their share. And then in chapter 4, verse 6, it tells us, The entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And this is so important. They focused their minds. They focused their minds. And then finally, in chapter 4, verse 10, we find that they were working around so much debris and rubble that it sapped their strength. They lost that focus. And so they had to deal with their rubbish. You can write that down last. They dealt with their rubbish. So they set their hands. They found their place. They shouldered their share. They focused their minds. And they dealt with their rubbish. And these are the five things that we should emulate in order to cooperate with the building that God wants to do in our lives. Fellas, let's put on our hard hats. Let's walk onto the construction site with Nehemiah and let's learn more. Well, first, read again chapter 2, verse 18. After Nehemiah's speech, the Jews rallied together. They said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Let me be clear. The Spirit brings letters, but you got to read them. And you got to study them. And you got to hide them in their, your heart. And you got to begin to obey them and put them to practice. He's not going to do that for you. You've got to do that yourself. The Spirit brings lumber. But you've got to rise up in faith and lay hold of the blessings that are yours in Christ. You've got to seek the Lord and receive from the Lord. God's blessings are free gifts. They're ours for the taking. But they've got to be taken. They can be left on the shelf if we don't believe. And the Spirit brings leadership, but you got to be open to it. We have to resign as the captain of our own ship and turn the helm over to Jesus. Trust me, the Lord wants to build. And you won't build, but it'll never be a reality without your cooperation. Are you a serious Christian? Have you rolled up your shirt sleeves and set your hand to this good work. Reminds me of the boss who was in charge of a group of summer workers, all high school kids. They were real slackers, quite frankly. And the boss was frustrated. One morning he announced, he says, okay, we're going to change the way we do things. One of the kids said, whoa, dude, you mean we're supposed to do things around here? (laughs) It's also true in the Christian life. You have a role to play. There's some things that you need to do. You know, so often we use cliches like just let go and let God. Stop trying and start trusting. And I use those expressions. I mean, they're needed reminders that we walk by faith. But we do walk. The right kind of effort is essential. Faith and works are not incompatible. The book of James teaches us that real faith will produce works. Understand, faith is not a passive trait. Real faith is aggressive. If I really believe a truth, I'm going to act on it. And I'm going to involve it in my life, in my thinking. If I believe Jesus has truly made God accessible to me, I'm going to seek him with my whole heart. Real faith sets its hands to do a good work. I have no doubt one of the reasons the walls were in rubble was nothing more than sheer laziness. I mean, the people were just glad to be in the land. Building a wall required hard work. and They just didn't want to expend the effort. And I also have no doubt that this is the problem with many Christians. We work hard all week to make a buck. We want our free time to be free. We're too lazy and perhaps too selfish to put any work or effort into our church or a ministry or our walk with God. Did you hear about the man who stopped to help a woman fix a flat tire? He saw her struggling and he decided to lend a helping hand. When he finished the job and he was about to let down the jack, the woman asked him, said, please, would you let my car down slowly? My husband is asleep in the back seat. That's one lazy fella. 
And yet I know men who are more than happy to let the church take care of the spiritual needs of their wife and of their kids while they crash out on the couch in front of the TV set. If you doubt that faith should be aggressive, listen to these verses. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I fight, not as one who beats the air. I press toward the mark. I run with endurance the race that is set before me. Men, if you want God to rebuild the walls in your life and in your church and in your community, it's time for you to kick it in gear. You need to set your hands to this good work. But second, notice in chapter 3, everyone found their place. Nehemiah divided up the construction and he placed each family in charge of a different section. Hey, if you don't want to be off the wall or beat your head against the wall, then find your place on the wall. God is doing a big work in the world today and he's got a section of the wall that he wants to build through your contribution. Romans 12, verse 4 and 5 tells us, For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Your body is made up of several trillion cells working together in harmony with one another. And it's a perfect type of the body of Christ. Each of us has a part to play. Your pastors can't do it alone. You need to help them serve the Lord. You'll create a great sense of fulfillment in your own life by finding your place in your church. The famous psychiatrist Carl Menninger, he once delivered a lecture on mental health. And after his talk, he was fielding questions. One of the students asked the brilliant Dr. Menninger, he said, what would you advise if a person was on the brink of a nervous breakdown? Everyone expected Menninger to say, consult a psychiatrist. Instead, he responded, lock up your house, go across the railroad tracks, find someone in need, and then do something to help that person. See, the tendency for us when we hurt is to lick our own wounds. But the healing comes when we keep on caring and reaching out to the people around us. Finding your place on the wall not only helps build it, but the person it helps most is you. Near the close of World War II, Jimmy Durante got an invitation from Ed Sullivan to go to the hospital and entertain some disabled vets. At first, Durante balked at the invitation. He was busy with several radio shows that night, but Sullivan insisted that Durante would come. All he was asking for was a single short routine. Well, that night when Jimmy Durante performed his sketch, the applause was deafening. The audience shouted for more. Durante picked up the microphone and he did two more complete routines of his comedy. Sullivan was shocked. And when Jimmy Durante exited the stage, Sullivan, a- Sullivan asked him, he said, Jimmy, you were great, but you missed your radio shows tonight. Why did you extend your performance? Well, Durante pointed to two soldiers sitting side by side on the front row. Both had lost their arms in the war, and they were applauding for him by clapping their two remaining hands together. It so moved Jimmy Durante that he couldn't leave. And you know, this is how I think God feels about us when we learn to function together. No matter how skilled and gifted you are, on your own, you're incomplete. God places us in a body. And it's up to us to work in harmony with one another. And when we do, when you bring your little, your one arm together with his one arm, and the two of you work together, I think it so excites God that he doesn't want to leave. He works wonders among us. See, and Nehemiah gave everyone a section of the wall. And my question is, have you found your place? Well, the third step that Nehemiah took to rebuild the walls was to make sure that everyone shouldered their share. Notice in chapter 3, verse 5, 
certain nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. Apparently, apparently these guys thought that they were too good, too proud to get down and dirty and do the work. It was a poor example of leadership in an attitude that Nehemiah corrected. Makes me think of the amazing story of Dr. Evan Kane. At the time of Dr. Kane, every surgery was accompanied by general anesthesia. Dr. Kane was convinced that certain procedures, local anesthesia would be a better option. And to prove his point, he wanted to perform an appendectomy with just local anesthesia. And so he looked high and low for a volunteer, but no one stepped forward. No one wanted to be the guinea pig. What if the local anesthesia wore off too soon? Not good. Well, finally, Dr. Kane found a volunteer. And on February the 15th, 1921, he performed a successful surgery with only local anesthesia, the first one ever. And he became famous. But not just as the doctor, but also as the patient. For he operated on himself. What an example of leadership. That's real leadership. <laughs> he didn't ask anyone to do what he was not willing to do himself. And this was the exception of the nobles in verse 5. This was, with the exception of the nobles, this was the attitude of the Jews. They all shouldered their share to do this good work. Perhaps you've heard the report, Who Does the Work in America?, of the 327 million Americans, 76 million are retired, leaving 251 million people to do the work. Of those 251 million, 48 million are permanently disabled, leaving 203 million to do the work. Of those 203 million, there are 74 million under the age of six, leaving 129 million of us to do the work. Of those 129 million, there are 95.2 million school-aged children, leaving 33.8 million people to do the work. Of those 33.8 million people at any given time, there are 4 million workers on vacation, <laughs> leaving 29.8 million people to do the work. Of those 29.8 million, 15 million people work for the federal government. <laughs> leaving 14.8 million people to do the work. Of those 14.8 million workers, 2.8 are in the armed forces, leaving just 12 million people to do the work. Of those 12 million people, 10.8 million people work for the state or local governments, leaving 1.2 million people to do the work. Of those 1.2 million people, there are 188,000 folks in hospitals leaving us 1,012,000 able-bodied people to do the work. And of those 1,012,000 able-bodied people, there are 1,011,998 in prison, <laughs> leaving just two people to do the work. And quite frankly, I'm tired of doing everything. <laughs> Men, are you shouldering your share at home, at church, on the job? I mean, how would your wife or your pastor or your boss answer that question? It's a well-known statistic that in most churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. How our churches would be different if everyone just started shouldering their share. Did you hear the story about the four members that attended the same church? Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Well, the church had financial responsibilities. And everybody was asked to help. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it. But do you know who did it? Nobody. Yeah. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. Then the church grounds needed work, and somebody was asked to help. But somebody got angry because anybody could have done it. And after all, it was really everybody's job. In the end, the work was given to nobody, and nobody did a fine job. 
<laughs> on and on this went. Whenever work was to be done, nobody was always counted on. Nobody visited the sick. Nobody gave liberally. Nobody shared his faith. In short, nobody was a very faithful church member. Finally, the day came when somebody left the church and took anybody and everybody with him. And guess who was left? Nobody. Man, we all need to do our part. Well, there's a fourth attitude that is essential if you're going to be a part of the building that God wants to do in your life and in your church. Nehemiah 4 verse 6 tells us, The entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And see, this is strategic. They had a worker's mentality. They focused their minds. And this is important because it's so easy to get distracted. You know, we'll talk later about the enemy's attempts to do just that, to distract them. But we counter it with a mind to work. You know, when the Olympics were in Atlanta a number of years ago now, I remember the star of the Olympic Games that year was a man named Michael Johnson. He won the Olympic gold in both the 200 and in the 400 meter races. And at first I thought it was strange that Johnson's double victory was considered such a unique achievement. I figure, man, if you're that fast, you ought to be able to win the 200, the 400, the 100, whatever. It didn't matter. But evidently the nuances to compete on a world-class level in more than one distance are so fine-tuned so uh, significant that it's very hard to be successful in more than one event. And you know, that's not only true, I found, in track and field. It's true in all of life. For it's difficult to be world-class in more than one or two areas of your life at any one time. And that's why we have to choose where we want to concentrate our energy and our time and our ambitions. In what do you want to be world class? You've got to decide what it is you want to really be good at. You want to be world class when it comes to making money? Having a nice lawn? Staying up with a college football recruiting? Keeping a clean house? Tinkering with cars? Playing video games? Or online poker? Do you want to be known as a world-class online poker player? Or do you want to be known as world-class when it comes to growing your relationship with Jesus and building up the kingdom of God? I'm sorry, but you can't be world-class at everything. You've got to choose. My assistant pastor and I, we, we talk about this often. We both raised four kids. You know, we coached Little League, we pastored the church. People ask, well, how'd you do it? How'd you find time to, to, to do all that? Well, I believe that God gives you time to do whatever he's called you to do. The problem, though, is that we just didn't have time for anything else. Yeah, we had plenty of time to pastor the church and raise our kids. We just didn't have any time to play golf or work in the yard much or or do other leisure things that other people like to do. You see, God gives you time to do what he's called you to do. You just won't even have time for anything else. The problem is we want to do all kinds of things. We want to spread ourselves out thin. Remember Paul's comment in Philippians 3 verse 13 about knowing Jesus. He said, but one thing I do. See, Paul had streamlined his interests. It wasn't these 50 things I dabble in. It was one thing I do. Nehemiah also suspended everything else in his life for the same reason. Building the wall could not be delayed. He focused his mind. Nehemiah would tell you that if knowing Christ and growing in your faith and building spiritual walls in your life means letting your golf game slip, then let it slip. We need to build walls. Nothing is more important. And lastly, we find in chapter 4, verse 10, that Nehemiah's work on the walls almost got derailed 
The workers had to work around so much rubbish and debris that they began to lose heart. The people got discouraged. In other words, they needed to deal with their rubbish before they could continue to move on with their work. And I have no doubt that there are some men here today. You're a believer in Jesus. Certainly you are. And over the years, you've walked with the Lord in varying degrees of success. You've made some strides. You've taken some steps in the right direction. But you know in your heart sitting here this morning that if you're going to make any further progress, it's time to deal with some rubbish, some debris, some sinful and some selfish attitudes. Maybe it's a nasty habit. Or maybe it's a short fuse. Or you've picked up a foul mouth. Maybe it's an addiction to pornography. Or you're drinking too much. Maybe you've let yourself get too close to a woman who's not your wife. Every man in this room today has some spiritual rubbish that's cluttering up the work site. And we need to deal with whatever it is that's slowing down the construction. Notice in chapter 4 verse 11 what Nehemiah's enemy said. They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. They were threatening to hide in the rubbish and launch their attacks from there. And this is exactly what Satan loves to do. He finds the weakness in your life. Your secret sin. The chink in your armor that he can exploit. And it's from there that he goes to work to wreck and to ruin other areas of your life. And eventually to totally distract you from the work. This is why Paul warns us in Ephesians 4, verse 27, don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't even open the door. When the devil knocks on the door of your heart, let Jesus answer. We need to guard ourselves from the sin that so easily ensnares us. Remember what Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount? If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. What is it that causes you to sin? Remember, for Superman, it was kryptonite. Whenever he got around that rare green mineral, it literally sucked the life right out of him. What's your kryptonite? A desire for money? A lust for success? An unhealthy need for other people's approval? A lack of Christian friends? Too much idle time, too little time at home. See, some of us can be doing fine for weeks, and then suddenly we trip over some rubbish. We get down and defeated, and we become tempted to give up. And this is why we need to identify and deal with the cause of our sin. The Bible has another name for rubbish, by the way. It's called the flesh. My flesh is the unredeemed part of me. It's the remnant of my past life that I lug around in. When Jesus saved me, he made me spiritually new. I'm a new person in Christ, but the outer man, my flesh, stays the same. And in the flesh, I retain sinful thoughts and habits and impulses. And I want you to notice here in our analogy, Nehemiah doesn't remove the debris and rubbish. Instead, he leads them around them, around it, and he protects them from it. Here's an important point. As much as I hate it, my old flesh will be a constant companion until the day I die. See, I build walls while dealing with the rubbish. And the way I do it is by walking with my Nehemiah. Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 16, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit that lifts me out of the downward pull of the flesh. When I walk in the energies and in the guidance of God's Spirit, His power elevates my life. Evil only fills a vacuum. When my heart is full of love and joy and peace, I'm too busy with my place on the wall to get drugged down by the rubbish around my feet. The way you deal with the rubbish is twofold. You walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and you don't give the devil an opportunity. 
you deal with the cause of your sin. Well, if you're a man, you are a builder. And can you think of another building project more worthwhile than building spiritual walls for the kingdom of God? Walls of virtue and character and integrity in your own life? Walls of protection and provision for your family? And walls of influence and safety for your church? Don't be off the wall. Don't beat your head against the wall. Be on the wall. Set your hands to do a good work. Father, we pray you'll bless us. You'll fill our hearts with your power, with your love and your joy, Lord. Lord, fill us to such overflowing, Lord, that there's no room for distraction. Set us above the debris, Lord, and lead us in the Holy Spirit. Our Nehemiah. Lord, I pray you'll fill us with your spirit, Lord. Help us to set our hands to do the good work. Show us our place on the wall. Help us to shoulder our share, Lord. And to be faithful to you, Lord. We love you. We ask that our lives can count for your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.